Wow, another Mega Man video, John? How original! Look, those views don't lie, motherfucker. I know where the money's at. So it's the 90s. Console technology has taken a giant leap forward with the birth of easily accessible 3D gaming, thanks mostly to the PlayStation and Nintendo 64. <laughs> also, technically the Saturn, even though by all accounts it was a nightmare to make 3D games on, and golly gee, I can't understand why Sega's console business failed. The eternal protagonist of this channel, or antagonist, depending on the episode, Capsule Computers was still freebasing an unhealthy amount of raw, uncut blue bomber profits back then. With the third dimensional revolution beginning, and killer franchises like Mario and The Legend of Zelda announced to be making the dimensional leap, Capcom had to make sure they got their piece of the low poly count pie. But in the mid 90s, what we now call classic Mega Man was still in full swing in the 2D realm, as was the ongoing X series. Why I ruin a good thing by forcing 3D into it? Right, Capcom? This is just conjecture on my part, but I feel the sub-series split route was probably taken because it's way safer to make a Mega Man spin-off than potentially destroy the brand. Now, uh, let's see. The, this bit of the review is usually longer. I normally have more trivia than this. The problem would appear to be there isn't that much information about Legend's conception that I can find. Hmm, gonna have to wing it. As far as I can tell, the earliest public information related to Mega Man Legends is this image. This could be an indicator that the original Mega Man would have originally been the star of this new 3D game, but it's very likely this was just a test render to hype up fans and the press. At the same time, Capcom began revealing a game then titled Rockman Neo, a name that was used so far in development that even the game's E3 trailer, and the official demo that came with Resident Evil Director's Cut, still used it. The name Rockman Nova was also apparently tossed around at the time, but the devs eventually ended up on the name Rockman Dash, Adventurous Spirit of Steel, the Dash being an acronym for Dig Outer's Adventure Story in Halcyon Days. Yeah, that's... <laughs> That's not gonna fly in English-speaking countries. I mean, it is just a weird title in general, but I feel like the big reason for changing Rockman Dash to Mega Man Legends is that the word Dash would impress onto potential purchasers that it's a racing game of some kind, which Mega Man Legends is absolutely not. It's an early attempt at a third-person shooter adventure game hybrid, somewhat similar to titles like Tomb Raider, exploring dungeons and solving simple puzzles while engaging in gunfights within a 3D space. While third-person action Action games are the norm here in 2021, this was a risky venture back then, translating a beloved fast-paced reaction-heavy franchise like Mega Man to what was fairly new technology. Coming out the other end of this venture in one piece was not guaranteed. So how did they do? I have no idea. I've never played these games outside of renting Mega Man 64 one time back way in the early 2000s, so we're gonna be finding out together. In a world covered by endless water. If I have to listen to that line one more fucking time, I'm gonna make Legends 3 myself just so I can cancel it this time. While no year is ever given, Mega Man Legends is presumed to take place hundreds if not thousands of years after the events of the other Mega Man games. In this time period, the Earth has been completely waterworlded, that is to say, flooded to an extreme degree. The remnants of civilization live on a spattering of islands across the planet, using airships to traverse the vast distances between viable land. To power these ships, alongside pretty much everything else, society uses crystals called refractors to generate energy. Refractors are found in the vast unknown ruins beneath the surface world, and thus, one of the most important jobs a person can have in this society is being a digger, or dig-outer in Japan. Diggers use various types of equipment to explore these ruins and trade the valuable scrap, machinery, and refractors for profit to make their living. But digging is a dangerous job, as most of those abandoned dungeons are swarming with reaver bots, protector mechanoloids left behind by whatever extinct civilization left all these underground tunnels in the first place. The Holy Grail of digging, and the main drive for all diggers is to find the Motherlode, a treasure said to be so great that people will never have to worry about running out of energy again. Mega Man? Mega Man? Mega Man? Can you hear me? Just barely. The transmission isn't too clear. I got worried because the transmission got cut off suddenly. I'm okay. I think this is the last door. <gasps> A new precious blue boy.
The Legends version of the Blue Bomber is a 14-year-old digger, Mega Man Volnut, and his sick anime hair. You might think it's dumb to point that out, but Volnut is pretty consistently depicted without his helmet to help distinguish him from his fellow forgotten brothers and sisters. The first thing I noticed right off the bat about the game doesn't really have anything to do with gameplay, but there's actual voice acting in Mega Man Legends, and to my surprise, it's very passable. Great! What about the refractor? It's here! It's a big one, too! Alright, now maybe we can finally get some money! No one's gonna be winning an award for their performance, but for a PlayStation 1 game, and a localization at that, the characters are pretty well acted. You'll get to hear some more as we go along, but this is a positive first impression. And then I picked up the controller. Okay, so anyone who's played Legends knew this was coming. Moving Mega Man around is... <coughs> Yeah, I understand why this game is controversial already. I know control is a very personal and subjective thing, but I'm gonna try and explain this the best that I can. It's hard to put into words why the control feels off. Mega Man is pretty fast, especially going left and right, and his acceleration is immediate, which is jarring when you take your first steps. You move forward and backwards and strafe left to right with the D-pad, but the camera doesn't move at all when you do this. The camera in Mega Man Legends has absolutely no passive movement and has to be moved manually with L1 and R1, which also turn Mega Man tank control style. There's no right stick camera control controls because the dual analog controller didn't even exist until shortly before the game's release. To cut to the point, and the reason these controls are quite off-putting for a first-time player, Mega Man always faces away from the camera. It is always at his back. It's impossible to, for instance, look to your left quickly while keeping your body facing forward. You can only see in the direction you're walking, and it feels very restrictive and almost claustrophobic at times, most notably in the game's dungeons, which are tiny cranes and claustrophobic as it is. Because you can't look around and move, and because Mega Man is so fast, even basic actions like picking up loot dropped by enemies is stressful in this game, because oh boy, you're not gonna be able to pick up all that loot before it disappears. Not with these controls. But as funny as it would be to whine and moan about the controls for another five minutes, I have to be fair. After switching the function of the strafe and turn buttons and playing for a few hours, I did acclimate to the movement about 80% of the time. You eventually get a weird sort of combo motion system going on, moving forward, strafing to the side, and holding down the turn buttons to replicate smooth 3D movement. Yeah, I shouldn't have to do this, just to properly see where I'm going, but the point is that the controls don't don't ruin the game, you just have to cut Legends a break for being old as opposed to fighting against it the entire time. You don't get mad and shove grandma down the stairs if she isn't walking fast enough, you know what I mean? Once you can walk correctly, we can talk about the other junk. Being a Mega Man, Volnut of course has a buster cannon on his arm that fires energy pellets. Their color and size changing depending on the upgrades you collect. You have two slots in your buster by default, and parts can be dug up or purchased that increase its attack self-explanatory, energy, the amount of shots that can exist at one time, range, how far your shots go before dissipating, and rapid, which is your fire rate. As a compromise for the camera jankiness, Mega Man can enter a zoomed in mode where he locks onto any hostile on the screen. Plus, you can pop into the options and switch it over to a free aim mode instead, which you actually get more use out of than you might think. You would be forgiven for thinking this solves all our controller woes, but for Reasons, Mega Man can't move a single inch when the zoom trigger is held, making this function worthless in the back half of the game, where the enemies are constantly jumping and charging at you. He can also kick stuff. I... I don't know why this is here. There's a few environmental interactions with it, but it's never anything important. It is fun to dick around with, though. Mega Man, I'm showing a large blip in front of you. Probably a Reaver bot. <laughs> I think I've managed to parse the strategy here. There's a slight auto lock to your shots even without holding R2. So by strafing while holding the opposite direction, you can circle around enemies while still attacking them. It's a little cumbersome, the camera gets stuck, and the tracking on the bullets is suboptimal, and I'd rather just be able to aim with the right stick, but it's doable. And I'd better get used to it, because this is the top tier combat strat for the whole game, boys and girls. Mega Man stuns the robot long enough for him to just barely escape the ocean tower, and is picked up by his friends in their airship, the Flutter. Phew. 
Nice timing, Roll. Anytime, Mega Man. I'm sorry, Mega Man. I had some engine problems, and... It's okay, Roll. But I'm glad you showed up when you did. All's well that ends well, right? And we were able to get a refractor. Man, I cannot get over how good the presentation here is. There's this cell shaded edge to everything, and nothing is overly blurry or has its texture stretched to the point of being indistinguishable. It's still very much a PS1 game, but it's one of the cleanest looking PS1 games I've seen, and it does it all without completely tanking the frame rate to single digits. I love you, Silent Hill, I'm so sorry. The celebration of Mega Man's heist doesn't last long, though, as the airship's engine starts billowing out smoke, forcing Roll to crash onto the nearest land they can find, an island named Catalox. Oh, I see it! Land ho! Come on, hold together! Just a little bit more! Hold on! I'm taking her down! Right! Jumping out at the crash site, we inspect the extent of the damage, while taking a look at the other protagonists we'll be hanging out with in this game. We've got the previously mentioned Roll Casket, Mega Man Spotter, and best friend slash love interest person. She's anime inventor smart, meaning she can quickly create tons of weapons and gadgets with few parts and a little effort despite being a teenager. Her parents were a digger team that disappeared when Roll was young, and her desire to help Mega Man find the mother load is likely tied to that tragic event. Her grandfather, Beryl Casket, took custody of Roll when his daughter and her husband vanished. Beryl is an old archaeologist who studies the mysterious ruins around the world and the treasures hidden within. He stumbled upon the orphaned Mega Man Volnut a few years ago and graciously took him in and raised him, despite having no idea who Mega Man was or where he was from. Also, Data is there. I feel like I've seen him somewhere before. Best described as a monkey head on a toaster, Data can save your game, restore your health and weapon energy, and somehow works as a hint system. You can ask him what to do next at any time, and he'll helpfully point you in the direction of the plot. Speaking of the plot, Beryl asks Mega Man to go take a look around the island to find a town of some sort so they can fix their ship. And you're not sure where the town could possibly be, huh? All right, then. Oh shit, hide my stuff! The island's law enforcement suddenly show up and escort Beryl to the mayor's office to go get his immigration papers filled out. Oh, if there's one thing kids love in their action platformers, it's tedious bureaucracy. While we wait for the gang to get their green cards, Mega Man finds a small shopping mall and there's- Hey, 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 I know you! Get the fuck back here! We visit a junk shop to look for parts, but one of the owners left for a dig some time ago and hasn't returned. It's not that far away, just back outside town. I was getting myself ready to discuss the rest of the core gameplay, but we just walk into the ruins and find him like one room away from the entrance, surrounded by the weakest enemies in the game. What a winner, folks. Dungeon Talk will have to wait. Back at the store, the couple tell Mega Man that while they don't have any ship parts, they do sell weapons and weapon parts, and give us a special module of some kind as a thank you. Volnut goes back to see Roll, who identifies the module as a mine thrower that can be fitted onto Mega Man's arm. She's able to get it up and running, so now we have our first alternate weapon. It drops mines. That officer from before shows up and gives Mega Man his city ID, but warns against going in right away, as a band of malicious pirates is approaching. With Beryl still inside the city, the blue dude goes in anyway to make sure Gramps is safe. I know you're bored. Just don't worry. The game is gonna start soon. I promise. Okay, got it? Once the decision's made, there's no turning back. Nothing less than 100%. And remember more than just guns and ships. Whoever has the most information that wins, right? Right! We understand! Huh? What are you looking at? Huh. Bossy Sundere with skin-tight leggings? I'm sure the Mega Man community has an intensely normal and completely healthy relationship with this character. We're permitted to wander around the main city at this point. And while there are a bunch of NPCs to talk to, none of them really say anything interesting or worthwhile. It reminds me of the townsfolk in the various Kingdom Hearts games. Yeah, they fill up space to make the world more lively and give the occasional joke or tip, 
but I completely ignore their existence 95% of the time. When you've had your fill of low poly boxes inside low poly boxes, you can go to City Hall where Beryl is meeting with Mayor Amelia, who turns out to be one of his old research assistants. They're discussing the legendary treasure said to be on Catalox Island, which is likely what the pirates are after. Gramps says he's only heard myths and stories about the Catalox treasure. I imagine his difficulties stem from the fact that he literally did not even recognize the name Catalox when we crashed 10 minutes ago. Perhaps his brain is dissolving. Alrighty, it's time for a fun fact. I don't think it's fun this time. In the Japanese version, there's two ways to get rid of this dog. You can interact with it, which triggers a cutscene where Mega Man more or less just asks it to leave. This option is still available in all versions of the game. But in the original Japanese game only, you can punt the poor little fucker and send him packing. Tron swoons over Mega Man regardless of which method you partake in, which says an uncomfortable amount about her standards, honestly. Just mind your own business! This situation applies to the entire game. It was possible to kick and shoot pretty much all of the animals in the game. The English staff clearly said, um... Fucking why? Followed by removing said feature, only allowing you to hurt animals that are antagonistic towards Mega Man. The whole animal abuse thing played heavily into the game's morality system. Yeah, Legends has a morality system as well, and it's actually surprisingly close to the moral points mechanic that would later be added to Battle Network 4 and 5, in that Mega Man's armor lightens or darkens depending on your actions. Breaking vending machines, hurting animals, and being a general asshat will cause your karma to decrease. Completing main quests and helping people out will give you good boy points. Though unlike Battle Network, there isn't much, if any, reason to concern yourself with the specifics. People in town will dislike you if your karma is low, but it only looks to result in a little bit of alternate dialogue, doesn't seem to grant anything extra, or lock you out of any events. I know they're both made by Capcom, but it's still pretty surprising to see how much DNA is shared between Legends and Battle Network. Welp, moral quandaries aside, Barrel's alright and Catalox Island is safe for the moment. Should go fill Roland on what's happening. I should just walk away right now. Well, we get some use out of that mine thrower here. You're meant to destroy the giant tanks and protect the homes of the townspeople until you find the key to City Hall. But I happen to get the key out of the very first one, so not much to say about this. to you, everything's a mess now, isn't it? Huh? Aren't you the girl who's being chased by that dog? Shut up! I don't want to hear about that! Do you know what you've done? Huh? You're a lot dumber than you look. You should have known better than to pick a fight with the Bonds. Of course, if you agree to become one of my servants, I suppose I could forgive you. Join up with pirates? I don't think so. You know, guys, I'm not super keen on this crush Tron has on Mega. It's a little unsettling to have this grown woman thirsting after a teenager. I excuse me? Uh, no. Prior to actually playing these games, I had always assumed Tron was about 20. At the very least, I thought she was older than Mega Man and Roll. Mega rushes uptown where a whole army of bots are demolishing the city. You have to destroy all of the robots before they tear down City Hall and the surrounding buildings. And I've already found the fatal flaw of this mission. We're facing a ton of respawning enemies all at once, and the controls and camera are less than cooperative. While facing a single opponent, the clunky controls and awkward aiming can be maneuvered around for the most part. When you have to face an entire squadron of enemies, some of them flying and some of them on the ground, it's a pretty big ask for the game to have me kill things quickly and protect the city while also watching my own back. There isn't any free manual aiming in this game, and locking on zooms the camera, limiting your peripheral vision, while sticking your feet firmly in place. It's pretty fucking tough to fight a dozen robots flying around, lock onto the correct one, not get blown up by the constant bombardments being dropped in from off screen, and do it all in a time limit. Yeah, I got wrecked here. 
The mission isn't too difficult on its own looking back after having completed the game, but it is asking a lot of the player considering we've only done the tutorial, a two minute snippet of a dungeon and a boss fight up until this point. Trying to figure out what I could do to help my pathetic self, I went back into the shopping center and for some reason the parts store is open now. I'm positive it was closed when I tried to come here a few minutes ago, but never mind that. We got a decent chunk of change to spend on upgrades. A few life ups, strength and range parts for the buster, and this game's equivalent of an E-Tank, the Energy Canteen, which is a single item that can have its capacity increased rather than multiple individual tanks. I also stopped off into the options menu and this was the point where I learned that the lock-on feature can be turned off and instead pressing R2 will let you free aim wherever you want. Thank God, because the lock-on is hot trash against flying enemies. Bon Bon, the youngest Bon pirate, and possibly a fully robotic head thing that looks like a Met, swoops down after we save City Hall. There's nothing complex about this boss. The only attack I had trouble with was a volley of homing rockets, but I realized you can easily dodge them by running towards Bon, causing them all to collapse into each other. I guess it could be pretty annoying if you don't have any range increases for the buster yet. the heck happened to Tron and Bond? They should have been back by now. Oh, those two? No, I told them they were in charge, so I won't worry. I'll let them take care of it themselves. Mm. Hey, look at the clock! It's almost time for my favorite show! I almost missed it! Next story. Teasel, the final and oldest of the Bond siblings, is pissed when he sees the town praising Mega Man on the news, having foiled his plan to get to the legendary treasure. Since stealing the key into the ruins beneath the island is no longer a choice, as was his original plan, he decides it's fracking time. <laughs> Mega and Roll reconvene with Beryl and Amelia, with the mayor giving Mega Man a digger's license so the gang can search the ruins for potential ship parts. Excuse me. But it seems we'll never get off this island, as the police burst in to warn the mayor that the pirates are excavating the forest outside of town. Mega Man worries, rightfully so, that the police stand no chance against the Bonds, and chases after to help them. With that, the opening section is finally completed, and we're pointed towards the first chapter that reflects the gameplay style of the rest of the game. Believe it or not, this is an EDF, and we do do tasks beside defending cities eventually. Set loose outside of town, exploring the wilderness, and even some option tunnels around Catalog, and I finally have some more genuine praise. This is the part of the game I enjoy. I just love exploring 3D spaces, especially more retro 90s styled ones. There's just something I really like about wandering around and finding secrets, doing some platforming, you know, boomer shit like that. I'll tell you now that Legends is short for an adventure RPG kind of game. I'd guess around five to six hours if you ignore the side content, but it tries to make up for that length by being dense. You're always doing something, or working towards something. Something as simple as moving from one place to another can still be made worthwhile by boxes and trash cans to loot, or reaver bots to kill for money. I never recall following a fork in a path just to find a dead end with nothing to collect or do. <coughs> The game almost always rewards your curiosity with buster parts or junk that roll can transform into more special weapons. Hell, even if it's only a small hidden cache of refractors, I don't feel like my time is being wasted, something you guys know is one of my most hated video game sins. Beyond the woods, Mega Man finds Teasel already tearing up the land around the gate, intending on digging straight down into the ruins, which I don't think would work. If the entrance shaft is too sturdy for you to break with a giant missile shooting dump truck, what makes you think the rest of the place is made out of some kind of sissy material that you can break? We should stop him anyway. The Malverf can't be attacked directly. Nothing I do hurts it. It's possible to take out the treads, which theoretically limits the machine's movement, but it still had no problem spinning in circles and running me down. You are told to attack the hatch up on its back, and nothing happens. After a death or two, I realize you have to attack it when the hatch is opened. Turns out though, that if you just spam mines at the door, the surf bots can't do squat and you can win the battle in mere seconds. I mean, at least I didn't have to strafe around it? Mega Man is congratulated by the mayor for his efforts, but 
there's still more work to do. The treasure the Bonds are trying to dig up lies beneath an impenetrably sealed tower that the residents of Catalox call the Main Gate. The treasure it protects is absolutely not to be disturbed. As legend says, unearthing it will cause a great calamity of some sort. Not good. Especially as large numbers of Reaver bots are activating in the ruins around Catalox for no known reason. Something plot related is going on around here, and Amelia asks Mega Man to spelunk through the digger sites on the island to hunt for clues to the treasure's whereabouts and what this great disaster entails. Before heading out, we chat with Roll about the new support card she threw together to assist on our mission. Bring her spare parts and modules we find on our adventure, and she can turn all that garbage into armor pieces and special weapons, as well as upgrades for the individual stats of said weapons. Heck, I was even able to toss together Mega Man's helmet. Not that I don't like Volnut's anime spikes, but it's nice to have the iconic helmet as an option. <sighs> the world is open to us now. Linear narrative takes a back seat for a bit. There are three specific ruins we have to look into, called subgates, but aside from that general direction, we're given free reign of Catalox Island. We can do whatever we want. Let's be a dick instead. But to do bad, we must first do good. All those refractors we've been scrounging up have been converted into Zenny, the world's usable currency. And while it's tempting to spend it all on upgrades, it may be wise to use some of that cashish to rebuild the sections of the city destroyed by the bonds. It's actually fascinating how this side quest works. It's completely dynamic. The amount of destruction caused during the opening chapter here determines how much it'll cost to fix the place up. It's a really neat continuity thing that makes the island feel more like an actual place outside of boss fight background, and it makes your early performance resonate through the whole game as a reminder. The city's state decides what side quests you can partake in, obviously. Or for our purposes, the police station and the bank. If both of these locations are still intact, you can do a few extra missions, helping the police find bombs, talking to the townspeople to find a missing bag, boring hero shit. What we need to do is head aboard the Flutter and check out the news, where we'll tune in to reports of a high-speed chase downtown. It seems the cops are chasing a group of surf bots that stole an entire briefcase full of money from the bank. So being the ever-helpful chap Mega Man is, he walks back to the city and just guns them down in the middle of the street. The briefcase will drop once the car is destroyed, and Mega Man can pick it up himself. If you talk to the police chief, he'll thank you for returning the money and give you 20,000 zenny as a reward. But... what if we don't talk to the chief? What if we just kinda... Ooh, that was faster than I thought. Stealing the money from the serve bots is the single most evil action in the game, bringing you down to maximum bad karma no matter what. Who cares? Negative karma doesn't do anything, and you get 200,000 zenny, enough to buy pretty much every upgrade you could possibly need from the shop. Well, it's only been two hours, and we destroyed both the karma and currency systems. Might as well get back to the main campaign. Find the gates and save the island, or what have you. The first place I went to was the Forest Gate, it being the first one I had seen in all. It's not a sub-gate, but there are quite a few new rooms explorable since we were here to rescue the shop owner before. There's some parts around, but nothing plot related, and nothing to fix the flutter. So to get to the other ruin gate in the woods, we have to fight through a gang of tank piloting serve bots. Roll even comes along with the van to give us a hand. She really just serves as cover if you need it, this section is super short. It turns out there's a big old locked gate around the dig site, though. I got a couple of weapons to pick from. I wonder which one... Right after riding the lift down, Mega Man finds a giant yellow refractor, similar to the one from the intro. Only this one's locked up tight. Roll explains the starter keys for the locking mechanism are missing, but should be stored in the temple somewhere. Like, in an altar or a special room or something? No, just like... on the floor. On cliffs and shit. No wonder these ancients went extinct. They probably misplaced the three magic keys to the fridge and starved to death, the poor fucks. Mega looks around the ruins for these three green starters, and it's just a good time. I don't know how else to describe it. As you're likely already sick of hearing me say, there's always something to do. The game doesn't really waste space, even if that space is very limited. Even normal-ass walls sometimes have secret holes that house various items or money. 
Grabbing the last key involves a little puzzle where you have to break some collapsing platforms and turn on a conveyor belt to smash open a rusted chest. Even fighting enemies is satisfying, uh, again, as long as there's not too many, because then the game's limitations really start shining through. These wasp nest beehive looking bots are really bad with that. Also the sheer amount of loot they drop. I'm not saying tons of rewards are bad, but even now I still have problems collecting everything that enemies drop. These controls just aren't that precise for a ton of quick, speedy movements in a small radius. This is why the Spyro games have sparks collect gems that you get near, to avoid these sort of little frustrations. It's fine in larger areas, like this bit, where you have to quickly press the buttons to turn off all three shields, but in limited spaces or on the edges of platforms, eh. I desperately start wishing for a basic two-stick control scheme again. When we're finished clearing the place out, Mega Man nabs the yellow refractor, and even he's surprised when he's not bombarded with more Indiana Jones crap afterwards. Nothing's happening? The yellow refractor isn't strong enough to restore the flutter to working order, but we also can't sell it since it may be useful for finding the subgates. So the gang hangs on to it for the time being. As far as the rest of the booty goes, I found parts for a grenade arm. Oh boy, a third weapon that throws explosives. And much more useful, a pair of jump boots. No, no, not yet. We'll get there. These fuckers launch Mega Man into the air. There's been a handful of obvious high ledges in the ruins so far, so I figured we'd get something like this eventually. Oh, so Yellow Refractor. After way too long spent searching through town, I discovered a little boat rental place out on the pier called... You know what they say, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Oh, golly gee willikers, another video didn't come out when John said it would. What a surprise! I know it just sounds like excuses, but I am working on a bunch of stuff behind the scenes to try and improve the quality around here, and most of that stuff's been holding me up. You'll see when we get to it. Right now, I have some fantastic cobs to thank. Cobs like Sopensi, Kyoshomi, A Lazy Dragon, Evan Brisky, Olan, Old God Machinations, Fox McCloud, JL, Lukia, Michael Caboose, Papa Nurse, Pokedude 12, Ronald, Soulless Hollow, Suniyama, The Luminate Gamer, Alu, Ineffable Aeon, Robert Meadows, Brushwag Collector, Bleh, Jordan Hawkins, Logan Ross, Slapman, Stefan Lewis, The Orange Cow, Adrian Marceau, Gadgeteer Blue, Baba Zendine, Maxi 89C, Miles Weidman, One Bite Man, Siku, Wesley De La Vieira Fernandez, Chance, Frozen Courtroom, Jaxic, Joshua Regear, Curvis, Melting Keith, Stefan, Zamad, or Zamad, sorry, I'm not sure which one it is, Isol, Alec Hanna, Alex Meeks, Andrew, Andrew Dowdy, Andwar, Anthony Dorado, Aqua Allison, Arbajest, Arlai, Aurelius, Azaki, Based as Otar, Bat Mabel, Beluga, Ben Smith, Brandon, Brito, Kronos1009, oh, I'm gonna ruin this one, uh, Sian Hamer, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Clark Rappel, Cody Allen, Cody Gratner, D3D, Daniel Miller, Dirtman.exe, Donald Nestor, Eclipse SLSR, Emperor Aquagem, Ezekiel Campos, Fallen Angel X00, Fateburn, Flame Solus, Flora, Ford Cliff, Gary Tina, Getsugaru, Gooby, Grim, Hadou Kant, <laughs> High Performance Moth, Ian Peterson, Igor Podolsky, Jacob Adam, James Courtney, Jebin96, Jim Kurosaki, Roxas of Malice, Jonathan Russell, Joshua Lewis, Julius Kingsley the 13th, Justin Ellis, Carol Hollingsworth, Larkales, Leighton M, Lemlom, Levardos, Lexir, Brawl9977, Luke Jacobson, Lunamoth, Mako Yin, Marcos Garcia, Mason Jones, Matthew Kyle Bielmer, Michael Mills, Minuteman FMJ, Mobius Knot, Muda Muda, Nicholas Jensen, Noah K, Nocturnal Igus, Partey Pooper, Poopman, Pyro Kazoo, Celeste McCombs, Sane Madman, Seth Highwind, Shiki, Shinzel, Society Max, Steve Melgar, Super Blue Electro, Terry Fan, The Koopo Mog, The True Azure, The Wandering Zebra, Thomas Jackson, Tomahawk Swing, Turbocharged Nerd, Tyler Fox, Tyler Markowitz, Ven the Hunter, Will Bang, okay? Weebman.exe, When is Mega Man Battle Network 7, Wolf888, Zachary Nelson, and Z Tier Beta. Yes, I did say all of them again. 
I have to let you know now that when we hit 200 patrons, I'm probably going to have to lower the out loud name callouts to people with slightly higher donations and just leave everyone else with an on-screen shout out because I, uh, I don't think I have the, the breath to put a five minute one of these at the end of every video. And one last big thank you to everyone who is not a patron. Just doing simple things like liking the video or sharing it with your friends it really helps me out around here against the almighty algorithm. And it is greatly appreciated. There's like some social media or something. I don't know. It's on the screen. Uh, I'm tired. It's two in the morning. Thanks again. <laughs> have a great day. Uh, and I'll see you guys in the next one, whenever that is. <laughs> Buh bye bye